Welcome back, everybody, to episode five of the Back Lounge podcast. My name is Tank. I'm your host, and I'm a retired roadie with over 15 years of experience in the touring music industry. And if this is your first time listening to the podcast, what we do here is have on artists, band members, other roadies, and anybody else in the music industry, and we just have conversations about whatever comes up. And for this fifth episode, I have a very special guest. This is somebody that I couldn't wait to get on this podcast because I've had them on my YouTube channel before, and it's somebody that I've gotten to know pretty well over the last year or so. We talk pretty frequently offline, and I'm just fired up about this. So for this fifth episode, we've got Grant Truesdell, one of the guitarists from the Canadian metal act, Unleash the Archers. Now, before we get started, I do have to throw a disclaimer out there. We got hammered by technical difficulties when we filmed this episode. I don't know what happened, but for some reason, there was a delay in our connection. Every time I would ask a question, it would take a few seconds to actually get to Grant. And there's some pauses, and then there's times where we step over each other because of the delay. And there was also some audio issues on Grant's end. Now, I don't know if it was specifically his audio or just Zoom malfunctioning. I don't think any of this is his fault, nor is it mine. It's just one of those moments where shit happens, I guess, man. You know, we just had to deal with it. Now, I was hoping that it was just something in the moment on Zoom. And when I pulled the audio, everything was fine. But that's not the case. You're going to hear some audio crackling, some pops, some weird stuff going on. And I do apologize for that. But I felt that we had to release this episode. Normally, if the audio quality was subpar for my normal stuff, I would probably just tell Grant, hey, let's just film another episode. But we started talking about it and I was like, you know, I don't think we're ever going to be able to like authentically replicate the conversation that we had. You're never going to have the same conversation with somebody twice. And considering some of the things we talked about and the subject matter, I actually feel that it's very important stuff that may help people if they hear this. So we made the decision to just release this as is, even with the audio difficulties. I'm going to go through this, clean it up as much as I can, but I know it's not going to be perfect. And because of that, we had a sponsor for this episode, but I don't feel comfortable plugging them on here, knowing that this isn't the normal standard of audio quality I usually have. So we'll just put them on the next one. So That being said, if you still want to support the channel, feel free to go to tankthetechmerch.com. There's a bunch of merchandise related to my channels on there, and it not only helps me, I actually split the profits with the artist that came up with some of these logos as well. And you could also sign up for Patreon. It's patreon.com slash tankthetech. I've got a couple tiers on there where you can support my channels and With both of the tiers that you choose, you actually get early access to all of this. So you'll hear the podcast episodes early. You'll get my YouTube reactions and other content early. So just know that if you do any of that, it really helps out this channel and this podcast. And it lets me continue to do more of this. But since that's all out of the way, one more time, just a reminder, we did have technical difficulties and the audio on this is not going to be up to the usual standard, but The conversation was great. I feel like people need to hear it. So without wasting any more time, Grant Truesdell from Unleash the Archers. Grant, thank you for taking the time to be here. It's good to have you back. How are you, buddy? I'm very well, man. Any chance to sit down and talk with Tank the Tech, I will take advantage of for sure, man. Oh, you're making me feel too good about myself here, man. Well, you've you've been on the channel, so you know how this kind of works, but today's going to be fun because... With the new podcast, we just talk about whatever we want. We don't even have to talk about, I don't know, Unleash the Archers, even though we will. Come on. That's why most people are going to listen to this. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, I, I don't even, uh, I'm not even thinking about picking up a guitar right now. I just yeah. got a yeah. nice big stein of coffee, sitting down for a nice chat with my buddy, and uh, we'll see where, where things go. Yeah, dude. It was funny. I was actually just thinking of all... Well, I've been kind of thinking about this all morning because I knew I was doing this, but I just had to run to the grocery store and I walked down the soup aisle and I'm just like, <laughs> I just started thinking of Grant. So for, for people listening that don't know, Grant obviously regularly streams on Twitch 
and there's a channel point redemption for <laughs> called soup and it's this <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to know the story of this because I get excited every time I have enough channel points to use it because it's just this animation, like this anime animation of people arguing about being at the soup store. Where did that come from? Uh, and it's not a cheap redemption either. You got to get 10,000 uh, points. Yeah. You got to be hanging out for a while. Um, where did it come from? It was a recommendation from one of my mods, Bally. Uh, he was like, you gotta get this on your channel. And this was like when I, he was, he was the one who helped me get set up on Twitch. So I, at that point I was like listening to everything he said as if he was, <laughs> you know, God himself was like, okay, I gotta do what? Yeah. I gotta add what things add this soup meme. Yep. Sure. Let's do that. And then it just kind of took on a life of its own and it is spiraled out of control. I feel yeah. like people come yeah. to the channel just for the soup meme. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's pretty damn entertaining. I didn't know if that was something that, like, somebody had just found and, like, gave you or if that was something that somebody created. I didn't know if there was more to a story to it than that. No, I think it's it's been done in a couple different uh, versions. You know, there's the anime one that we have, and then there's – it's been done in, you know, the same audio but with different video. And obviously you and I have been talking about recreating it. Yeah, uh, yeah, dude. The only thing about we'll probably about, use we'll probably use that same audio. Now thinking of it, <laughs> well, well, I was it was funny because I was we we've talked about recreating this actual meme in person, but then I started thinking about it. I'm like, this is gonna look really awkward walking into a grocery store and like trying to film myself, <laughs> like being like, I'm at the soup store. Like people are gonna be like, yeah. what is this fucking guy doing? <laughs> uh, security to aisle five <laughs> yeah like, we gotta get this <laughs> <laughs> the grocery like, store why was the meme recorded in five different grocery stores well we could only get a line in every grocery store <laughs> yeah um and, so uh, this um, is this is gonna be kind of awkward your microphone is popping like crazy oh, okay <laughs> i don't know how down. or why but like we're using the same kind of mics it's, yeah. probably, it's probably something on my end. Down a bit. Maybe, maybe. I don't know if that's it, but we'll figure it out, dude. This is These are the real moments. These are always the funny moments where everybody thinks that everything... It. What's that? I get excited sometimes, and I get a little loud, so that nah, might be you're it. good. It's still kind of there, but it's not, like, brutal, so whatever. We'll just roll with it. These are the real moments that I always joke with people where I'm like... Everybody thinks that everything we try and do is so professional. I was like, nah, dude. Like, this is... You know, mistakes and all. Flying whatever. on the wheel of her pants. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, what makes it yeah. fun. But uh, so everyone on yesterday was actually telling me to to get some soup for today's session. <laughs> really? I, I was just like mid session. I was just gonna start eating soup. <laughs> Dude, it's so fun. I mean, the, we keep talking about soup. I would have I would have lost my shit. I'll tell you that. We we started letting wow. uh, Ingrid. Uh, Ingrid's one now, which is crazy. I feel like the last time I had you on here, she was like. A baby baby <laughs> like yeah 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 yeah. but we let her play in the kitchen now and her favorite thing to do is she opens the cupboard and pulls all the soup cans out and she rolls them across the kitchen floor <laughs> like oh nice yeah i was it, half expecting you to say she sets them up like drum set like a drum oh, set and plays them that'll dude, be next dude the first time i set up my electronic kit and like sat her on my lap and let her look at it she was like enthralled i'm like oh man i'm gonna have a little drummer here just beating on everything nice but <laughs> dude it's so to get the energy out yeah oh absolutely and she has a lot of it um speaking of twitch yeah <laughs> i i, I want to get your your gauge on twitch because you've been doing twitch for quite a while now and you're very regular with it as well how many times a week do you stream do you have a normal schedule for the most part when I when I'm do have a normal schedule, yeah, it's about five to six times a week, a couple different times a day, because I, I can only do it for like kind of short periods, uh, yeah. you know, two hours a time, you know. So I I just try to sneak in whenever I can. Um, if I didn't have kids and all that fun stuff where I have to drive and pick up and drop people off all the time, I'd I'd stream like you know a full day type thing, but. Uh, yeah. Dude, it, this, I was thinking about it actually going into this interview. It's like, it's going to be weird doing an interview without a live chat 
scrolling next to us <laughs> right yeah i i actually somebody yeah. gave me the idea about maybe doing a live podcast episode with chat and stuff like that and then you know just editing it later but i'm like that would be insanity because we'd probably be reading the chat half the time and just laughing and like doing stuff but it could be it could be interesting because we might get some funny questions and stuff but dude it, it's so funny you brought that up because i say that to people all the time and i don't mean it as a complaint um about the kids and stuff but people mm -hmm. sometimes on YouTube are like, well, why don't you have time to do this? Or why don't you get your videos up as fast as so-and-so? And I'm like, dude, I got a, a one-year-old and I live with, you know, I have a wife and I have so much other stuff going on. It's like, if I was still like a single 20 year old, yeah, I'd be able to just keep going oh, and going and going. Yeah. Things would be a lot different. I was, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's, we're we're constantly juggling things in our life and uh if you just focus on one thing then you drop all the other balls yeah for sure it's it's been an interesting balance and i, and I would imagine for you as well because not only do you balance the twitch and the family life but you also have the band like do you um you guys were so starting last summer you guys kicked off on tour again and then you were doing some dates and stuff like that and obviously had some cancellations with everything going on but um when you're not in like a touring schedule how often do you get together with the band and just practice or jam or whatever yeah it uh there'll be there'll be months where we don't see each other at all and then there'll be months where we're seeing each other like four or five times a week Oh, so yeah. we kind of go in, in like, you could say waves or seasons um, where it's it's really focused when we do get together and it's purposeful, right? Uh, like back in the day, you know, eight, seven years ago, we would just meet up all the time just to jam, mm -hmm. right? Just for fun. And But now, you know, things are just different. We're all a bit busier. Um, so we... You know, when we're, we like to, we find that taking time away m helps when we come back to things. One, we're like, we're not burnt out. Uh, two, we have like a new perspective and things are fresh, especially when we come back to write. You know, it's like we've had time to grow separately so that we, we're not just in the same mindset as, as we just left off. So that each album has a new approach a new outlook, new influences, things like that. So it's like, it's like all or nothing. Yeah. Right? It's like, sometimes we'll, we, we won't see each other for months and we'll just kind of like work on our own personal lives and, and things like that. And then it's like, okay, it's go time where it's time to like really start writing. Uh, we've spent some time away from each other, woodshedded. We all come to the table with all these ideas yeah and it's it, the, or, the time uh, or if, like we're gearing up for yeah, yeah or like if we're gearing up for a tour it's like a different mode too it's like okay we've we've got the set we're working on the stage production the production of the of the live show and that's the focus so yeah very yeah. purposeful yeah and the time apart can help too man i mean even just from my you know it's been years since i was actually in a band but touring as well sometimes if you're if you're around as much as you like the people you're around sometimes after a couple months it's just like i need a break from these people <laughs> like, yeah. yeah yeah exactly man we've spent like a decade with each other it's yeah it's, i think it's important for uh <laughs> our own mental health and yeah it's 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 like one of those one of those cheesy sayings you know it's like the sign of true fa friends is that you can grow separately without growing apart yeah, you for know? sure. Totally yeah, agree with time, that. Every time you come back to each other, it's like nothing has changed and it's, you know, your family and you're, you're still as close as it was, but with a new, uh, with a new breath of fresh air. Yeah. I've had that happen on tour so many times with people where like I've done a tour and I've made really good friends and then we go like four or five years without seeing each other on a tour again at all. And then the next time we see each other, it's like we picked up where we left off. It was like we spent no time apart whatsoever. Exactly. It, that's a great, great feeling. Yeah. Like what? And, you it know, is, man. It is. and for the first time in a while, you guys have an official bass player again. So now you're 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 five now. So 
It's nice, yeah. So Nick joining the band, um, and I know he he plays guitar as well, so I'm sure that's you know easy to work with. But I assume he's somebody that you guys had known for for quite a while before you had him like come in permanently, right? Yeah, we uh, we put him through the the trial for years <laughs> before we put a ring on it for sure. Yeah, yeah. we met him, I think, in 2015, 2016. When he was playing bass, kind of filling in for another band called Crimson Shadows from out east, we were touring together, and that's when we met him. And uh, he's just a, a very infectious guy who you just love to have around. Uh, and he kind of lives for the moment and for jumping on musical opportunities and is a very versatile musician. So when we needed a touring bass player, he was like one of the first people we thought of. Uh, and he has been on board for the past three years, just jumping on any tour that we need. And uh, it just got to a, a point where it's like, okay, we this is this is happening. You can't really deny it. Yeah. You know, he, like, why don't we just make it official? So like, he's not going anywhere. Yeah. So I actually, I actually didn't know that until you said that he's been your touring bass player for the last few years. Um, so I guess it was mm -hmm. inevitable. So I always just assumed because dude, there's so many bands now that don't have bass players at all. Like, so I just assume when I see no bass player with a band that when they tour, they just use tracks or something. Do you guys even track stuff live? Do we what? Sorry. Sorry. Do you do you use tracks live like click track and stuff like that or no? Yeah, we use a click track. We uh, we've just started using some synth mm -hmm. live because of the new album it has a lot of synth in it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, so we do. We've never played with like backing bass tracks or guitar tracks. Okay. It's always just been the added stuff that like we haven't played on an album, just. Uh, you know, make it sound the same as the album when you play yeah. live. Samples and like in between songs and stuff like that. Speaking of that last album, I actually I actually listened to Apex and Abyss last night from start to finish, and there's there's a reason. Oh, wow. There there is a reason for that. So I'm gonna tell you a quick story and then I'm gonna show you something. So the people on YouTube will see it, but the people listening, I'll just explain. So back when I was a teenager, I had this like dirty old battle jacket, as a lot of metalheads do, and. <laughs> I wanted to like find it again and I had no idea where it was and I thought it'd be at my parents' house and it's just lost. So I decided, I decided to make a new one, you know, a little late in life to make a battle jacket, but I decided to make a new one and hold on. And last night, the reason I was listening to UTA is because I have this, um, I had this tradition that every time I'd sew on a patch, I would listen to the band I was listening to. And I just got, oh, nice. I got the wow. UTA First patch. Uh, second, I've but I have a pile of them. I just haven't gotten them on there. My first patch uh, got this nice little thing that says Metalhead, but uh, yeah, the UTA nice. the UTA patch is <laughs> oh, that's like cute. that's cute. Yeah, the UTA is like perfect because it's in a good front spot. And center. Yeah, right, right in the front and center on the back. I'll throw a little back patch underneath it, but it's been fun because I was talking about it and people are like, "You know how to sew?" And I was like, "Yeah, most most metalheads know how to sew for that reason." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that that patch took both albums time to sew. Yeah, I'm slow. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm very slow. Meticulous. I, meticulous. I'm 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 slow and meticulous, but like I I watched, I if the first one that I did took me so long that I watched a YouTube video of like this like drunk metalhead dude doing battle jackets, and he's like, yeah, so each patch should take you about three minutes, and I'm just like, fuck, what am I doing wrong? Now I will say that's Jesus. a that's a pretty thick patch and it it took some effort to get yeah. through but but at the same time yes I'm fucking slow and I probably so like an idiot but it but by the time it's done I feel really good about it cuz I'm like I did that and I feel accomplished like I have some pride in it Yeah <laughs> and you know you got to listen to both albums like Exactly you're, you're taking the you're taking the scenic route you know? Yeah and then, You're and there's, enjoying it. And, and when like, it comes when it comes to music, I don't get me wrong. There's songs that I like to put on, like individual songs from albums that I really like, because like there's a handful from you know your last album, Abyss, that I I love. 
But that's one of those albums for me that's like start to finish. It's like even if I finished early, I probably would have just kept it on because it's such a fucking good album. <laughs> mm. I mean, so. trying to keep that alive, you know, a lot of a lot of artists and stuff are doing the singles and yeah, things like that. We're trying to keep like yeah. the, the the album alive, you know, where it's like a piece of piece of work from start to finish, where it's it, you know, it it is greater by listening to it all. For sure. And was not that to... the first time you've listened to both albums start to finish? Because I know you've been doing like reactions, so you've been holding that, off that might have, listening to it all. That might have been the first time I did both of them in order, like for the story. I've listened to both albums nice. from start to start to finish on their own before, but I think that actually was right. the first time where I started and went through both of them without stopping and really paid attention to like the story and the lyrics and like that's one of the things I love about those albums, you know, the concept and the story behind everything. I'm sure you've talked about this a million times because, you know, last time we talked, I was still fairly new to Unleash the Archers and I was, I was holding off on stuff for reactions. But at this point with what I'm doing on YouTube, I'm doing new releases only. So since I'm not going to be going back for anything, it's like, I've listened to your whole discography at this point and it's fucking a wild right. trip because you've got different, you know, a little bit different of a style early on to now and stuff like that. But when coming up with the concept for those albums, is that a, is that a, like a, a Britney story or is that something that everybody kind of got involved in? Yeah. The story is all Britney. That's, and that is what comes first, you know, mm -hmm. uh, she comes to us. We, we kind of usually wait to write any music or anything until we get the story. Cause that really guides the music mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so she'll, it won't be like completely detailed. She won't have any lyrics written, but she'll have track by track what's happening in the story and kind of what feeling the song should be to represent what's happening in the story. So then uh, she'll start with that. Yeah, it's it's all her world. It's all her universe that she's been creating. Um, and she's done a fantastic job, no doubt about it. Yeah. And then uh, we'll start writing yeah. songs. Sometimes it'll be specific, be like, okay, we're going to try to write this track, you know? Or sometimes we'll just write a, write a song and then she'll be like, oh, that's totally this track, mm -hmm. right? Um. So it's it's quite the the funny story, funny process because I've talked to some other bands who do concept albums and they do it completely the opposite way where like the music comes first and then they try to create the story to fit that and it's like yeah. you know there's not one right way to do it really but uh I feel for us it gives everything a lot of direction and purpose when the story comes first. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to hear that writing process that way, because as you mentioned, there is no right way. And a lot of bands do it differently. When I was in a band, we usually came up with music first and then our vocalist would, you know, get his lyrics in over it. And I know there's a lot of other bands that do that, but when you're talking about a specific concept story, I mean, you're the way that you just described seems like the best way to do it for the overall vibe. And that's a, a big part of that album is the vibe through every different song and the feeling that you can get. I mean, dude, by the time I get to like the wind that shapes the land, I'm like just fucking ready to just conquer the world. You know what I mean? <laughs> nice. That's, that's how it should be, man. You know? Yeah. That's some of the, the yeah. best, the best uh, comments or, or stories I hear about people listening to our music is how it is affected them in that sort of way you know where it's mm -hmm. actually translated into real life help and it's like damn like that is that is unbelievable <laughs> that's a wonderful <laughs> thing about that. music that i i feel needs more attention um you know metal has the stigma to to pop culture that it doesn't really have substance that it's just noise and angry and blah 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 but any any metalhead will tell you that the music that they listen to they can connect to emotionally and for a lot of people and at times for me too music is more therapeutic than anything like the emotional connection that you can make with it especially for you know a metalhead that's into their metal i mean that's a that's a very powerful thing 100 percent, yeah and uh, that's, you know, that's, that's what I, I, tr I strive to do in my life 
outside of music as well, you know, it was like to inspire other people and to make people dream big and, and to help them, you know, think more of themselves and things like that. So if we can do that through our music as well, which will hopefully, you know, live on past our own personal lives and continue to do that is like, is the biggest gift. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's funny because in a, in a weird sense, I, I try and do that too. When I'm doing YouTube stuff, I know that you might get it, but other people are like, dude, it's fucking YouTube. Like, you know, but there's a reason why I'm myself and positive in my videos. And I don't negative, I don't focus on, you know, drama or anything like that. Like there's a lot of other YouTubers that when there's drama with a band, they'll do a video on it or they'll talk about it and stuff like that. And it's like, I stay away from that kind of stuff because I just want people mm -hmm. that see videos that I make to have fun and have a good time and to maybe think about something in another positive way that they may not have. Like you'll never hear me listen to music and say like, I hate this. I always try and find something that I like about something, even if it's not necessarily my go-to or my thing that I would normally listen to. And I've had that happen a lot on my channel where it's something that I just am like, yeah, they're, they're wonderfully talented musicians. The mix is incredible. It sounds good, but it's not my thing. But sometimes people still take that wrong. Mm -hmm. Like people always want other people to like the same bands as them and they get mad when you don't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's it's that's pretty ridiculous. It's like expecting everyone to like the same food that you like. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, no, dude, I got different tastes. Like, you know, you might like it spicy. I don't. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So what... You know, what that doesn't what, mean you're right so or wrong. What, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one funny, interesting thing, and this is just the different in dialect, difference in dialects. When you were talking about the band writing and you said process that made me think of something funny that I wanted to like kind of bring up, like, w especially with international bands. I recently had a German artist get a hold of me that writes lyrics in English, but isn't a native English speaker. It was like, yeah, I, I had this meeting recently with label people and they kept saying <laughs> a word differently. And I just wanted to know in English, would you say process or process? And I was like, I mean, they're both right. It just depends. And he goes, well, as a non-native English speaker, which one should I say? And I was like, whatever one you want. <laughs> like, I find that so fu yeah, funny. Yeah. yeah. I think I say, I would say like for process as in like the, the act of putting something together, but the process is like, uh, um, I don't know, like the, the standard operating procedure of how it, how somebody like I hear does you. something in a factory. I like guess the process. I don't yeah. know. Well, it's, it's it, this, tomato, tomato it's, though, really. For sure. It's the same thing with words like, <laughs> like data and data too. Like they asked me about that and yeah. I was like, I don't even know what I say. Like half the time I think I say data and the other half the time I probably say data. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's 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 case dependent it depends on like the context yeah for me i think who knows i i'm not very aware of of how i pronounce things though yeah. until and, somebody brings it to my attention you know it's like when we're touring with like a, a international band and they all english is not their main language they're like you're really hard to understand because i use a lot of like slang and yeah. sarcasm and and things like that that aren't textbook <laughs> yeah um that's that the thing about the english language too is um let's talk about north america specifically depending on where you are that slang will change a lot i mean there are parts of the u.s that i go to that i'm like I have no idea what this person is trying to say to me right now at yeah. all. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was funny. Uh, one of the, one of the more recent situations was, uh, electric Callboys finishing their album. And one of their singers texted me and said, Hey, we, we have this line in our song and we don't know what would be the correct way to say it. And I was like, okay, what's the line? And he's like, well, we're saying like, a t back to a time where it all began. And I was like, okay, what do you, what are you confused about? And he's like, but should we say back to a time when it all began? And I was like, well, 
I, I, I could hear it either way and I would never think it was weird. Like if somebody phrased that both mm -hmm. ways, I would never question it or think it's weird. I've probably said it both ways. And grammatically, I, I'm sure there's a right answer, but he's like, well, you know, we just weren't, again, we're not native English speakers. And I was like, yeah, but we're native English speakers over here and we fuck up the English language all the time. <laughs> like, Yeah, and when it comes to lyrics, it's like you don't have to be textbook yeah perfect you now you can word things weird and still get the same message across and yeah sometimes yeah. you have to do that for it to yeah, fit yeah. <laughs> oh for sure especially when you're dealing with stuff like uh rap and hip-hop and stuff and the rhyming and the flow of everything i mean you get a lot of uh yeah a lot of different things that are changed with stuff like that just to just just to make the flow right and while maybe writing it out on paper doesn't make terribly terrible or terribly much sense when you actually hear it, you know exactly what they're saying, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sometimes it has to be rhythmic. Like, sometimes you got to make up words. Or, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, I, I can't think of any specific examples, but I, I'm sure I can remember moments where it's like, that's not even a real word. Like, there was, <laughs> I can't, I can't remember who exactly did it, but there was a rapper that had a song where they rhymed. They had two words that don't remotely sound similar and they changed the second word enough how it sounds to rhyme it with the first one. And I'm like, I, I wish I could think yeah. of that exact example off the top of my head, but I was like, that's one of those moments where I was like, that's that's some out there creativity to do something like that. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of vocalists have to pronounce things differently. So just so it, it rhymes. Yeah. One of the... Like, that's not how the word goes at all. <laughs> when you do vocals, do you ever specifically do stuff like that where you maybe do like a lisp or something just so it sounds better with the overall recording? Uh, yes, I, I want to say I do. I can't think of any, any specifics, but um, you, you, sometimes you have to, you know, it's like, especially with screaming and harsh vocals. There's a lot of like, um, almost like meowing like a cat that has to go on just to make it sound cool or like just to, to, to finish off a word. I was, like, uh, Chuck Schuldner did that a lot in death. Yeah. Obviously, um, Rob Zombie and White Zombie, but he <laughs> ends almost every line with, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude it's like every second yeah, line is a yeah yeah and there's other artists that do it i mean we joke about james hetfield doing it and chad kroger doing it and stuff yeah. like that but there's <laughs> more more recently i was watching the uh the one take vocal performance that will ramos from lorna shore did and i actually noticed that with him there's a lot of words that almost kind of like what you said like meowing like if he says like the word like yeah down, down or something it sounds like while he's screaming it he's more going like down <laughs> you know what i mean yeah yeah where you just like hold a vowel and then you can you, you continue it beyond its its end yeah <laughs> just Vocal just to keep yeah sorry dude this is this is bizarre man this is the most weird technical issues i've had on any kind of zoom call i'm starting to think it's neither of us i'm starting to think zoom is taking a shit right now because I feel as though we have like a two second lag between us, which like mm. I've noticed I've like kind of stepped on you here and there, but then I've noticed there's a pause after I talk. So I'm wondering if like we're being like tested right now. We're being watched. <laughs> yeah. They're like they're trying to <laughs> their thoughts. Yeah. These guys are trying to do a good episode. Let's just see if they can get through it. Are we on the Truman show? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, man. Uh, everything, everything. Is... Well, you know, is this where this podcast is going to go? <laughs> talking about the nature of reality. I mean, it could. We could Are we in about... a simulation? We could talk about anything. But dude, I've, I feel like I've been playing so much. I'm, I'm a big uh, gamer and I've been playing like a ton of Destiny lately. That's been my go-to game for like eight years now. Nice. And I, I read into the lore so much that I start like thinking about this and like questioning things in my everyday life based on the lore and like fucking destiny. 
I mean, you can't really prove that you're not in a simulation. You can't prove that you are. Yeah. It's one of those things. Like yeah. I've, I've watched uh, all the Isaac Asimov memorial debates. It's like this big science debate that happens every year at the Hayden Planetarium hosted by uh, Neil deGrasse. And uh, they have experts from over, over the world, across the world, come every year, you know, physicists, nuclear physicists, philosophers, all these things to talk about different topics. And one of the topics one year was, are we living in a simulation? And uh, in one sense, you know, everything is kind of coded to react in certain ways. Uh, but then you would never know if, if, you know, if you are actually in it. Not, I would never even... Uh, fully entertain the idea that we're in like in an actual simulation done by like uh an alien teenager or something like that but, <laughs> i uh, love that way, it's just the, it's the, one, the world it's one alien teenager it's not even like an entire race it's just one bored alien teenager that has us in a simulation <laughs> <laughs> well you know we just to think we're the smartest ones in the universe is uh pretty bold that's a very bold statement it's it's funny there's a there's a book that i or there's a author that i like named ernest klein are you familiar with him i don't think so no so he's semi-new he's a sci-fi writer he's the guy that did ready player one but he also has another book called armada and it's very similar to like the last starfighter and ender's game and stuff like that but he he very regularly talks about in the book how all the mainstream media that we have around us is not just people's creativity and imagination it's to prepare the masses to be there mentally when shit like this happens so for example uh the movie independence day like his thought in this book, like the character's thought in the book is that like Independence Day wasn't just somebody's creativity that they wrote, you know, a story for a movie about. It's they specifically made movies about alien invasions to basically mentally prepare the masses on, on the planet that when this shit actually happens, people are more like desensitized to it and don't fully just lose their minds. And I, I, I think about this so much now. <laughs> Wow. That is pretty nuts, dude. I right. mean, it, it's more it familiar. Is. Oh, I've I've seen this before. Yeah, this is where my brain gets zapped. <laughs> yeah, and it's like same with video games. It's like a lot of these sci-fi video games. Like the the theory, according to this book, is that these games are loosely based on things that these people know are real, and they're making it to de desensitize the masses to these things when they inevitably are going to see them or to happen. <laughs> Mind blown, dude. Yeah. I, I, I start looking at movies a lot different now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I watched the new matrix movie and I was just like, this is fucking out there, but dude, like this, it, it plays into that weird conspiracy theory, simulate like simulation theory. Mm hmm. Yeah. Is, well, it's the this, way technology is going. A lot of these sci-fi movies are going to be reality within our lifetime, if not our kids. Yeah. Like, dude, you know, the, Blade Runner. The chance that our that our heads Blade could Runner? be. Yeah. 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 <laughs> chance that our heads could be uh, in a little bubble on top of a robot living forever is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would you live forever if you had the chance? I, you know, I, I believe it or not, I've thought about this too, because this is another big part of destiny. They have robots, exos, that they basically upload mm. people's conscious and, and thoughts into, and then they can live forever as, mm. and as an exo. And I've thought about this and I've been like, man, it would be wild to live forever to like, see how everything changed and stuff like that. But Think about all the all your loved ones and all the people you've ever met in your life in that specific time. And it's like, they're just going to be gone and you're still going to be there. And inevitably, yeah, you'll meet more people and stuff like that. But it is it is an interesting thought. I, I don't know. I don't know if I would like to do that or not. 
I guess you would always have the option to to end it if you ever did. Hey, hold on real quick. Claire's but here. It is an issue. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Hold on. For for people listening on on uh, Spotify and stuff, this is this is the, another real life moment. My wife just came in and needs the baby monitor. Important stuff. This is way more important than what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We finally got her down for a nap. Nice. That's yeah. a that's a win right there. Oh yeah, dude. It's like we've we've progressed from her taking random naps throughout the day, like like forty five minute naps, just whenever, to we get like one long nap somewhere between like one and three every day, and then that's it. That's it. Well, consistency is nice. Yeah, for sure. She is nice. I've actually been able Did to Did she just it. turn white one recently? Um when was it? The thirteenth of March. So it was her birthday. Yeah, almost a month ago. Oh nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah, we're it's... at the point right now where uh yeah. we got the days uh free. Jethro's in kindergarten, Victoria is in daycare. So it's 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 nice. Spring break was pretty wild. <laughs> Getting the kids home all the time again, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's been nice to actually form a schedule now because when she was first born, it was, it was, it was, you know, you understand it gets kind of chaotic. It's like, you never know when you're going to be able to do something, whether it's clean the house or do, do anything. And especially trying to keep pumping out YouTube content, it was like, fuck. Like, she goes down for a nap, and it's like, all right, I'm going to go try and record right now and see if it happens. But now I can actually yeah, set a schedule and do it. And see as you and I know with creative things like that, it's a lot of it is about being in the zone mentally to do it. So it's sometimes it's hard just to jump into something yeah, uh, and do it. You know, yeah. it's like – getting started every time is the hard part. Like once you're already going, it's like if you could go in a solid eight hours, awesome. But <laughs> that, yeah. that's hard for guys like you and I to do. It's like leaving the house and going to the gym. Nobody, nobody ever. Well, yeah. I looked forward to doing that when I was still going before Ingrid was born, but there are a lot of people I know for sure. Like, yeah, once I'm there, I'm good, but it's like getting the motivation to go. Do you, yeah. um, do you ever have days where you're like getting ready to stream where you're just like, I don't want to do this today. That's yeah. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean the hard, the hard thing about, um, streaming is finding that balance between like still being productive on my own, but not just being selfish and doing productive things on stream, like still being entertaining and doing it for, everybody else and sometimes like i'd feel like i'm like i haven't prepared enough or something like that to have something new you know to be streaming like okay am i just doing the same thing all the time uh so it's sometimes when that like self-doubt happens it's tough but as soon as you start streaming and like you get you start hanging with everybody everything disappears and it's like oh I don't know what I was afraid of or like why I didn't want it. I feel like doing this, but you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm introverted by nature who is like a performer. So I just like, I know how to turn that switch on. Right. But I, I prefer to just kind of like work alone and like be doing my own thing and like just working on myself. But I, I kind of put that aside my own my own personal kind of um, um, feelings about that t t and get out of that to help others type thing, right? So it's like it's more worth it to be engaged with the public because of the impact that I can make on other people. But, you know, I could be a hermit and not talk to anybody for years and be fine. <laughs> yeah, I, but, I relate. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's funny. Well, that, because, it is, it is I mean, sometimes when it's like when you, when you don't want to necessarily be social, but you know that it's what you're meant to do in life type thing. You know, it's like, okay, this is what I signed up for. Like, this isn't so bad. <laughs> yeah. And I think when people watch, um, whether it's a content creator or a musician like yourself or, or 
both, let's be real, you're both at this point. People think it's it's very natural and easy and we're very outgoing people. Um, you know, my wife jokes that I'm a very extroverted introvert. Like I can handle social situations and people fine, but by choice, if it were me, I'd be like sitting at my house and doing nothing. Um, and I, I really learned with Twitch, you know, if you, if you, or YouTube rather, if you go back to my old YouTube videos, you can see the uneasiness. Like you can see how and early on when I was doing reactions and videos, I was not comfortable on camera. I, you know, and over time it just kind of develops. And what I learned with Twitch is that even when you want to do what you want to do on Twitch, there's a lot of days where I just want to play video games and stuff. You really have to keep it in your mind that you need to do what people want you to do. Cause there's times where I have more viewers on my Twitch when I'm just sitting and chatting about music and, and touring stories and stuff like that. I have more viewers for stuff like that than when I do the things I want to do, like play video games or something like that. So there is a balance where you have to give the people what they yeah. want versus what you feel like doing. True. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's the, that's the biggest um, thing to, to master as like that balance where it's like, you're still, you're still feel f feeling fulfilled and like, you're still enjoying it as well. Mm -hmm. But you're, but you're, you know, ultimately, you know, it's, it's twitch.tv. You're there to entertain, to educate, to add value to other people's life in some sort of way. And that is, you know, that is always like first and foremost, you know, nobody wants to sit, sit there and watch you, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, work on something for yourself if you're not adding value to them. Yeah. Um, so I always, always try to find a balance with that because a lot of the times, the, the, the only times I can, I can stream are times when I need to be working on things anyways, you know? So it's like, okay, how do I kind of do both and, and still add value to other people? But yeah, it's, it's tough sometimes. Yeah. And so one of the things I actually was curious about, because I'm going to end up doing this too. I don't know if I, I told you this. Um, some people know, but it, I haven't like publicly announced it, but uh, I'm going to be guitar teching for Electric Callboy on their US tour. And I heard about this. And, yeah. and I want to, I, I want to do content while I'm out there. And when you guys were on tour, you were like doing content and live streaming shows and stuff like that. Um, what, what did you have any major challenges out there or was it all basically dependent on just like the internet that you had wherever you were? Yeah, it's just the equipment, the data, getting the rig set up. Uh, the big thing is, is, uh, the data, the internet, right? So funny thing, man, I'm actually, I've, I've got a backpack. I've got a, like an in real life, uh, set up rig for streaming on the road that I am actually handing off to Daniel DK tonight. He's in Vancouver. He's doing a U.S. tour. He wants to do the same thing. I'm like, dude, just borrow. I've got everything. Just, just borrow it. Nice. So, um, so he's taking nice. up for the road. Um, you know, Herman has been doing uh, this multicam Mevo setup, mm -hmm. which I also have the equipment to do that. And the big thing for that is just having, you can use the same routers that I use or the same USB modems that I use for the backpack rig. You just plug those into the laptop and you can do it that way. So, you know, there's essentially those two options that you can do for streaming on the road. It's like the backpack where you can just kind of walk around, stream anywhere, or there's the, you know, having your laptop and having to set everything up in a, in a spot every night so i think those... I, I think sorry we're youtube's lagging us again or sorry zoom is lagging us again i didn't mean to cut you off um i think the only advantage oh, no that i have here is that a lot the bulk of my content is youtube so i'm just really gonna have to film and then i can edit later on down the line like i'm definitely gonna be doing some twitch streams and stuff but i don't know if i'm gonna need to necessarily 
get all that. Like, I don't think I'll need like a router or anything like that, because again, this is going to be more filming content and editing for videos later. But I, I thought you did a great job because I watched several of your guys' shows on your live stream. And I, when you were sitting in the, you know, I think you guys were, were you guys in a bandwagon? Yeah, we were in a bandwagon. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you've been in one of those oh dude i've done it all man i've been in dude when my band first started touring we didn't even have a 15 passenger we had a chevy astro van like so it was driver's oh, yeah. seat We've been too, yeah yeah so, you know so it was like driver's seat passenger seat we removed the two middle row bucket seats and then we just had the bench in the back so like dudes could sleep on the floor. And then we had a little yeah, TV yeah, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. with the little shitty tube TV that we'd play like Madden 2005 on. Amazing. Yeah. And those yeah, are, we've done, uh, yeah. those are fun times though, man. One of the like, first, one of the first tours we did was in a like old school, old, uh, suburban, uh, like, like a 95 or something like that. And it broke down. No trailer surprise. or no trailer? <laughs> no trailer. Oh, so you just put all the gear in the back and then piled in everywhere else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, that's amazing, dude. I, I love stories like that because a lot of people see road life as like super glamorous and stuff. And then, you know, y'all got to start somewhere. And a lot of us started in like Suburbans and Chevy Astro vans and sleeping in it rather than getting hotels you know oh 100 percent. you know we always we always slept at the walmart parking lots because they were free to to park in and uh, then you can go in and buy bacon in the morning and then cook <laughs> yeah. it in the parking lot <laughs> yes one of the tricks that we learned uh i i think a truck driver told us this but when we were in our little astro van in a trailer we we normally slept in it same situation walmart parking lot because you know there's there's bathrooms in there there's anything you need to buy you know and in, there's usually lights and security cameras and it's pretty safe um we had a truck driver tell us once if you ever want to stay at a hotel you ask them uh for a government discount and i was like how does that work he's like he's like if you travel so much so many miles on federal highways to complete your job and because you're in a band you have to travel on those highways to get to the job you actually qualify for a government rate at hotels so we used to go up to la quintas that are like already like 60 dollars, and we'd be like yeah we want the government rate and then we'd have to i'd have to like exp <laughs> i'd have to like literally they'd be like no you can't get this and i'd be like let me talk to your manager and then we'd go through the whole Do they process know what you're of, talking you know, about Fuck no, no, never. No. But they would <laughs> looking in their book. Like, what the hell is this, <laughs> dude? They would eventually just get. I think they would just get tired of talking to me about it, and they'd be like, "Yeah, sure, we'll give you like the seven dollars off." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so, but that was all that. All that yeah, but that was a off. that was a special occasion, man. We'd get a hotel room like once every ten days just so we could like shower and sleep on a floor. <laughs> Yeah, that was a, a luxury back then. Oh, yeah. And then it was crazy. The first uh, the first tour I ever did as a roadie was um, basically a bandwagon. Um, it was a it was kind of a bandwagon that the band had hired uh, Prevo to do to turn it into like a miniature actual like XL2 bus. So while it was tiny, it was set up exactly like a regular size tour bus. It had a front lounge, a bunk area, a back lounge. The back lounge was like the size of a bathroom because it was tiny. Um, <laughs> but then after that, the first tour I ever did on a bus, it really made me appreciate all the years of being like in the van and sleeping in the parking lots and all that stuff because it's just – that really is – you know, once you once you start touring in a bus – it does become way easier. And I tell people like, there's this funny thing where it's either people think that touring is extremely luxurious or they think it's extremely grindy. And when I see people that feel bad for bands that are touring in buses and stuff like this, I was like, don't feel bad about that. Cause they have 
a TV, a microwave, a refrigerator. They've got bunks to sleep in. They've got internet. Like touring on a bus is is pretty comfortable, to be honest. Yeah, you still have to have a few hobo skills, you know, living out oh, of a sure. backpack and things like that. But in comparison, you know, yeah, it is yeah. Uh, a world of difference. Yeah. Well, those those hobo skills never really go away, even when you're touring in a bus. Like you're. <laughs> You're good at knowing how to pack and knowing yeah. how to buy stuff and, and stuff like that. You, know, you, you almost need those those formative years of touring in a, a van and trailer or or worse to really hone and and build those hobo skills and and to really appreciate the bus life. Because if mm -hmm. you if you just went straight to a bus, I don't know, man. I don't know if you would appreciate it as much. Or if you would just be, like, too spoiled and think that's just, like, how it is. I don't know. It's funny you say that because I actually yeah, have I think... a good example for you. Um, yeah, I think you remember talking about this, actually. May I, maybe. I can't remember, but I'll, let me know. But um, back in the day when my band was touring, one of the first major tours we were on was with uh, Trapped. I don't know if you remember Headstrong or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, of course. Yeah, that was like all the NHL games. Oh yeah. Dude, Headstrong was that band's very first single. And it, it we know how big it got. It exploded them. So their first tours they ever did were in multiple buses and a semi for all their gear. So later multiple buses. So first tour multiple buses. Fancy. Yeah, so later on down the line and this was like when did Headstrong get big? Around the turn of the century, so like 2000. We toured with them in 2000. Say, yeah. We toured with them in 2008, and it was about the time that they were on a decline, and they were on one bus and a trailer. And the next, after we finished that tour, they asked us to do their next tour. The next tour that they did, they were in a 15 passenger van and a trailer. Most of their guys handled it okay. Their fucking singer lost his goddamn mind. Like, got to the oh, point man. where he would let his band and crew drive to the next shows, and this dude flew to every single show so he could stay at a hotel every night and not have to sleep in the van with everybody else. That's your that's wow. your prime example of not on who on Dude. whose dime I like to wonder. I don't know the answer to that question. If it was on the band's dime, that's pretty fucked up. But that's your that's your prime example of not having the experience of the the road warrior life and learning to appreciate those things because you know, I, I could tell you right now, I could easily do a van and trailer tour again just because of the years that I already did it. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes going to different countries, you you still have to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, even though if you're used to bus tours in Europe or US, you know, going to, going to Japan, you're not touring in a bus, most mm -hmm. likely. You know, you're, you're going van to, to hotels that you can barely fit in. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then if you go right. to somewhere like Australia, where you can't go cross country yeah. in a bus, dude, the, we did a week in Australia when I was on a tour once that I think might have been the most tired I've ever been in my entire life because you have to fly everywhere. And with our routing, right. we were going cross country every time. We did like, we started in Perth and then went Brisbane and then went Adelaide and then Melbourne and Sydney, but they flew us everywhere and we never had a day off. It was like six shows in six days. So you got to think we'd work all day, put on a show, go to the hotel and shower and maybe get two hours of sleep and then have to go straight to the airport i was just gassed that is tough man and yeah hotels on tour are just never worth it because you never get enough time mm -hmm. adam like i know when we were doing the bus and, and hotel or uh the van and hotel gig like you would get into the hotel three four in the morning you would be able to sleep till like seven or eight and then you had to leave because you had to start driving to the next show. Yeah. There was um, a lot of times even when, I, yeah, there was a lot of times when, even when I did a bus tour, I would go into my hotel room or a hotel room, usually that I shared with another crew guy 
and I'd shower, but I'd still stay on the bus. I would go to sleep in the bus because, you know, even if you're on a bus tour to hotel, you know, like you have to get up for bus call and stuff like that. I would rather just sleep in the bunk all night without interruption so I could just <laughs> wake up at the venue rather than having yeah. to wake up. Yeah, 100%. Up, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we got in a pretty good routine with the bus, you know, you, you, it does, it does make things a lot easier because you always have a bed. Like we would, we would get into a pretty solid routine where we would nap before the show, you know, like a bunch of old men, you know, <laughs> a couple hours before the show. It's like quiet time on the bus. We all have our like warm bowl of cream and tuck ourselves in. <laughs> I've never been able to do that. Oh, really? Oh, uh, it's, it's, oh not because I, I didn't have the time, just because for me, I feel like if I took a nap, it would like, as a crew guy, not like obviously uh, you're banned, but I feel like a nap in the middle of the day would mess up my routine of working on gear and everything else and stuff like that. But I had a lot of crew guys that would, they'd finish their jobs and then they'd nap from like when sound check ended and for like an hour or two and then get up. And I just, every time I tried, I felt like a pile of shit after. So I never did it. Yeah. Yeah. If I was a crew guy, I think it would be hard to, I'd be too worried about, you know, not thing, things not being ready for the show. Mm -hmm. But as, as, a, as the performer, it's like you, you plan all day, 24 hours for that, like, hour and a half moment where it's like you have to have everything physically and mentally ready within yourself for that time. So it's like, for me, it's like, man, I, I think back to the days where, like, you had to you loaded in in a van and you, you couldn't go anywhere else. You were at the venue from when you loaded in. And you're watching the whole show, like you're just so burnt out by the time it comes your set at 11, 12 at night when you've been there since two. And it's like, and it's just, you have no energy left. And somehow we still pulled it off. Like the thunderbolt of rock and roll would strike you as soon as uh, the first note was played. But now it's like you, you can put so much more into the show and you're so much more rested and, uh, vocally you're more rested and, and just everything it's uh so it's a world of difference and then the night kind of starts after that you know it's yeah. you get on a weird schedule yeah. where it's like okay now the night starts at two in the morning <laughs> even even as a crew guy i relate to a lot of that because i always found it funny when i i think about what i actually did as a crew guy as a roadie i work for 12 hours a day for an hour and a half moment you know what I mean? It's like we, we load in, we set up, we do yeah. all that. And it's exactly what you're talking about as a band member. But for us, there were also nights where, I don't know, for whatever reason, I just wasn't having a great day or like gear was broken that I, you know, had to fix and it just threw my day off. No matter what happened during in a day, though, no matter how tired I was by the time the show rolled around, it's like the second that showtime starts and that intro music rolls, it's like, like you said, like the thunderbolt of rock and roll. It's just like, all right, let's go. Yeah, it's, it's a trigger, man. Uh, some some athletes, you know, have certain rituals that they do before that, like, it's, it's, it triggers your body to preparing for, like, this moment. And uh, sometimes the intro music can be just that. It's like, okay, your body's like, okay, this is, it, it knows what's coming, so it prepares you. Yeah. It's like, we have a we have a buddy that plays in the NHL, and we always joke because he has nap time every day on game days. Like he has to get, he has to get his two hour nap in before every game. Otherwise he's like completely off. Dude, that's, that's me now. <laughs> that's me now. You know, like getting to a very good, you know, and it's also too, cause you're going so hard at night too. Like I've, uh, I've stopped drinking this year and I'm going to be carrying that through into when we tour again. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see how that is going to work on the road. And if I'm, if I'm still going to need that nap time, but um, I, I can see myself still wanting that nap. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So um, we don't have to get into specifics or anything. Did you just decide to stop drinking? Just, just health stuff, feel better, stuff like that. Pretty much out of curiosity, you know, yeah. uh, I never really drank when I was at home anyways. 
like I don't, I'm not uh, the kind of guy who just would like drink a beer at night just to calm yeah. down. I usually would smoke a lot of weed. Uh, that would kind of be my curve night, but I, I've stopped everything um, mainly as a, you know, it's something that I would, I would do frequent anyways, just as a, as a test of willpower, reset the old dopamine receptors and mm -hmm. things like that. And, Get get joy out of life itself instead of substances. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, it's. I think it's. I'm just like at a point in my life where I don't feel the need for it anymore. Um, maybe. You know, it's it's gonna be harder when we go on the road and things like that because it is, you know, more of a social thing. But I've had a few tests already. You know, I went down to the U.S. last weekend for uh the lords of the trident see to release show Saw that. uh and it was fine there I've, I've was i've been out to a bunch of shows in town and it's fine uh socially so you know i'm i'm really excited to see how uh how i feel in the mornings on the tour now instead of sleeping in until like until loading and it's like okay we're loading in like right now we're all i'll still i'll be able to get up and like go work out and do do the things that I love doing at home. So, well, I'll tell you right now, you will not miss the hangovers. Um we've I, yeah. I, I know oh, a lot 100%, of 100% dude. I Yeah. Um I was going to say I know no, dude, <laughs> it, this is fucking Zoom. The fucking robots. The robots are just trying to fuck this up. Um <laughs> so a lot of people know this. Um we've I to my knowledge, we've never actually had a talk about this, but I haven't drank since two thousand and seventeen. Something like that. Mm. Um now mine, full full honesty, like I was I was a raging alcoholic, dude. Like I it, I had a moment where it was like I'll actually tell you this story because it's wild. You're gonna be like, How did you not lose your job? Um <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, this is getting Juicy. Yeah. So I, I always drank. I grew up in a very like Irish family, like drinking was very normal. Um, but when I started doing country music, it got worse because I still maintain country tours party harder than any other bands I've ever toured with. It's absurd. It's such mm. a normal thing. It's like almost a job requirement that you have to just get wasted every night. Mm. So every year we did this festival in uh, Cancun. Uh, Luke Bryan, big country artist, had this like festival where it was all inclusive. You paid like a couple thousand dollars for a ticket. You got a week stay at an all inclusive resort. There's shows every night, and they bring down a bunch of other bands. So we went down there quite a few years in a row. And one of the years we went there, um, we got hammered on the plane. And then by the time we got to the terminal in Cancun, it was like 4 p.m., and I'm just like, just done already. <laughs> but when we got to the hotel, I decided to just keep drinking. So I went to the bar with some of the other crew guys and I'm drinking and drinking and drinking. And at some point I'm like full autopilot blacked out. I don't remember anything I'm about to tell you. This was all what was told to me after the fact. But apparently the guy that I was working for, um, I did not like his manager at all. I've always been open about that. I don't like how he ran things. I don't like how he talked to us and treated us. But at one point he walks into the bar that we're in and I guess that was the trigger that I needed. I kicked out my bar stool and went after the guy, like physically assaulted the guy in front of everybody. Um, <laughs> apparently, and then I guess they, you know, pulled me off of the guy and got me to my hotel room. And my next recollection of anything was like waking up. And this is such a horrible feeling is like when you wake up, after a blackout drunk and you don't know where you are <laughs> like yeah, yeah, was... i wake up and i have no fucking idea where i am and i'm looking around and i'm like fuck oh wait i'm in a hotel i'm in mexico okay where's my phone where's my wallet found those and i have a i have a text message from like our tour manager that's like hey whatever you do for the rest of the time we're here stay away from so and so the manager and i'm like okay whatever and then later in the day, and I was so hungover, and later in the day, people were like, dude, you're, you're fucked. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And somebody told me what happened, and I was like, really? And like, I had no idea that I did any of this until the next day. And I just, 
I had a moment. Like I just had this moment in my head where I can't explain it. It wasn't a thing, but there was something in my head that was like, I'm never drinking again. Like that was yeah. my moment. And I will say I have successfully not drank since then. The funniest part about this story is that that guy got fired and I didn't. The, the manager got fired like two weeks later and I didn't. What? Yeah. For what? Being a shitty manager, probably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For not being able to fucking beat up the, the guitar tech? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, man. But like, but yeah, I went, uh, I, I stopped drinking. Wild. Now, my big thing there was like you'd said, like uh, uh, weed became my vice after that, where it was like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to drink, but I'm good with anything else. And then I, and then like any person that has any kind of addiction problem, I don't care what anybody says. If you have the personality for it, you can be addicted to getting high. Mm -hmm. Now, weed itself does not have addictive properties in it. We know that, but the feeling that you get from it, you can definitely develop an addiction to. Yeah. So long story short, when the pandemic started, I was like kind of terrified about like being home. I was like, dude, all I'm going to do is smoke weed. I might start drinking again. And then I just decided to stop everything. So I, I've been over two years now of literally nothing. And to be honest, I feel better. Now, I don't think I'm better than anybody else that does. I don't mind if people drink around me or smoke around me. It was just one of those things that for me, my personality, I didn't like who I was anymore doing those things. So I just stopped. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's... It's really what it is. It's like everybody has their own issues and their own tolerances to everything. And it's about knowing what you can and can't handle and what it does to your personality. Really good on you, man. That's a, mm -hmm. I, I'm surprised that you didn't uh, drink the rest of that trip. Like he was like, <laughs> you just stopped like that day. Like I'm not drinking at the festival. I will say there was a moment where I had one of those hair of the dog things where I was so hung. Oh, and the next, the next day we had a show but it was, uh, they do pool parties at this resort. So it was an acoustic show at the pool with no cover and it's 105 degrees out. <laughs> so I'm like, wow. <laughs> so, so I'm hung over, I'm sweating like crazy. And I had a moment where I was like, hair of the dog, I'll have a beer and it'll make me feel better. And I reached for a beer and my production manager at the time literally put his hand on me and was like, don't do it. Mm, and that was- goodness. That was the, that was the, probably the saving moment of me, like continuing, just being like, okay, I'm not going to drink. Yeah. Cause that's, that's all it is. It's just like a, a one day at a time, one mm -hmm. moment at a time, you know? Yeah. Just, and, uh, sometimes it's, it's all about identity too. You know, you just, you just identify as a non drinker, you know? Yeah. I mean, Drinking itself was a huge part of my identity for so long. I enjoyed yeah. being that guy that had the reputation that could out drink everybody and party his face off. Yeah. But after a while, it just got stale. It got old. It got old yeah. So. Yeah. It's like, is that, is that the guy that you want to be known as? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, okay, you know, you get to a, a point where it's like, okay, what well, kind of like Mark do I want to leave on this earth? You know, it's like, yeah. what do you want to yeah. be known for? And, one of the other big things that's helped me personally is, you know, I got sober before our, our daughter was born, but when I found out Claire was pregnant, that was even more motivation for me to just continue what I'd already been doing because it's like, mm. I'd already, I've already said like, I didn't like the person I was when I was drinking and doing anything else. And I never want my daughter to have to see any of that. So like, she's a big part of my motivation also to just, you know, keep going the way I've been going. And I've had this conversation with, with people on our discord and other people and stuff like that. And it's, it's really interesting that if you can be that person that's open about it, going back to what you were saying about leaving a positive impact on people's lives, I've already had people come to me that have watched one of my videos that heard me say I'm sober. And they're like, wow, man, that's, that's awesome. Like I'm sober too, but it's like, I don't say it out loud because I feel weird. And I was like, don't be ashamed of that. Everybody's got yeah. their own path that they walk. Yeah. Like you said, it's, it's not about passing judgment on anybody who, who, who doesn't follow that path or who isn't into that because, uh, you know, sometimes you have to go through that journey. Like just like going touring in a van to appreciate 
the bus. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, so you, sometimes you kind of have to go through that almost kind of destructive path to be able to appreciate not doing that. And who's to say that not doing it um, isn't part of that journey? Yeah. You know? So, like, you know, it's for me, it's been, like, it's just been, like, since, like, 2015, it's just been... I kind of like opened up to this uh, this world of like personal development and like and working on yourself more than you more than anything else, you know, and and how important that is, and that um, you know it's just it's just one more thing to continue along that path, you know, that I, I find helps me more than holds me back. You know, like I had even even more severe substance abuse and addiction problems than alcohol, you know, harder drugs that I was hooked on for yeah. five, six years that I haven't really spoken about in, in detail a lot. But, you know, I was in full disclosure while we're here talking about it and being honest and vulnerable and open. You know, I was I was hooked on methamphetamine for like five years, mm -hmm. you know, and. It's just been a slowly progression of just getting better and better and being doing more healthier things uh, opposed to the the latter, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, dude, first of all, thank you for being open and sharing that because, like, I, I firmly believe, man, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of different recovery programs for any kind of different thing, you know, and stuff like that and just meeting different people. From the stories I've heard, I've, I, I honestly firmly believe, like, people with addiction issues and stuff like that, like our secrets can kill us. Like, yeah. that's why I'm yeah. so open about everything that I went through with everything. And it's like, you know, I, um, I, I speak to a lot of sober people regularly that I hear stories from them. And it's like, in a crazy way, it's like, I'm, I'm fortunate and grateful that I didn't get any worse than I already was. Cause one, yeah. one, one piece of advice I got from a, from like an old sober dude once was, uh, you know, early on when I was sober, I always used to be like, well, I hear all these stories from all these other people about going to jail or losing their kids or losing their marriages and all this stuff. And I was like, I never had that happen to me. So am I as bad as these? Like, do I have it as bad as these other people? And this guy told me, he's like, addiction is like being on an elevator going down. You can stop the elevator and get off at any floor you want to. But if you stay on that elevator, eventually you're going to hit the bottom. And I'm like, damn. Mm. damn. Mm. He's like, you just happen to get off earlier than a lot of other people. And I was like, F mm. fuck. <laughs> like a very good metaphor. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it really stuck with me, man. Like that's it's one of those things that I will never forget. Yeah, it's a tough lesson for some people because sometimes you, you keep hitting that what you think is the bottom. But it's like, no, you yeah. can go even further than that. And mm -hmm. uh you know, for a lot of people, you have to hit, you know, sometimes it does come down to that crisis that turns people around. Some people, it's, you don't need to hit that pure crisis to, to make a change. Uh, but it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough for anybody to, to accept that and, and replace an addiction like that. You know, you don't just completely get rid of it. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's really like some of them, some of these things aren't addictive in nature, but it's the dopamine that you get addicted to. You know, it's those, those peaks of dopamine. And, you know, that's, that's one thing that I've been um, studying recently is, is, is dopamine and how it works. And, it's, you know, you have like a base level and it's the difference between your base level and the peaks that determine the excitement and the, the happiness you get. But there's always a crash from it. Right. So, uh, it's these, it's these peaks and valleys that, that you're addicted to. And then if you take that away without new things to replace those, you're going to feel depressed and things like that. And it's easier to resort back into those easy ways to get those peaks of dopamine. So like when I stopped, I replaced it with with doing fitness and, and working yeah. out. Yeah. Right. So it's like, you always got to try to find a, uh, an, a healthier way to get that same feeling. 
because your body is still going to crave that which is which is really tough and it's easy to fall back into that and you got to have enough like motivation and reasons why you know you can't just be like oh i i kind of want to do this you know it's like mm -hmm. you got to really cultivate why you want to do it and if you have enough reasons why then it's like okay this is easy now like yeah and it's funny like you just mentioned um anything can become an addiction due to that dopamine that you get i mean um yeah. food uh you know sodas and it really anything there's a funny joke have you ever seen the movie get him to the greek with russell brand i don't think so oh i've, I've, I've heard i've heard the show is it a show or a movie it's a movie okay yeah, yeah. oh it's fantastic okay. movie um it, it, it's it's a it's a good like rock star movie um russell brand plays like a fictional super rock star who used to be like larger than life and he kind of fell off and blah 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 but there's a there's a scene in the movie where they talk about how he like notoriously got sober because he used to be a party animal and he's arguing with his ex-wife and he's like I, you know, he's like, I got sober for you. I kicked everything. And she's like, yeah, but then you did yoga for nine hours a fucking day. She's like, you can turn anything into an addiction. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, that's absolutely true, man. Yeah, dude. It's the, the human mind is, a is, a, is a, a tricky thing to, to please. You yeah. Know? Dopamine just wants more dopamine. That's, that's its kind of purpose. And it's not a bad thing. But it's, you know, those, that's one of the things that I uh, realized many years ago. It's like, and I'm sure you can have experience or anybody listening to this can have, uh, relate to this as well. It's like, it doesn't matter what you have or what you do in life. It's like, it's, it's the quality of your emotions that determine your day. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have everything, you can have all the freedom but then if you're like, you're not inspired, you're not, you know, doing something that excites you. It's like, or if you're pissed off and angry at everything, it's like, that's, that's your world. It doesn't matter how much money you have. So it's like, I, I come to realize that what matters most to enjoy my life or like just the day is like the quality of emotions that you experience. Mm -hmm. Like that is like, in, and then when you get to a, you know, I got to a point where it's like, okay, I'm like full-time musician. Like I got, I can plan my own day the way I want. It's like, oh man, like it, it's almost like kind of a blessing and a curse sometimes. It's like you have no direction sometimes. You got to like, okay, what, what is going to make me feel uh, the most meaning where I'm like still contributing to, to, to something and like, yeah, it's it's a it doesn't matter what level of life you get at, that's still the thing you have to battle with. You know, people mm -hmm. who are completely successful, it's like how are you continuing to cultivate your emotions every day and doing yeah, stuff yeah. that that make you feel excited and happy and I think I think a big part of that too that plays into how we think about ourselves in our everyday lives and stuff like that is uh is I think this is a normal thing for every human being, but we focus a lot on what other people think about us. We're worried about other people's perception of who we are and you know what they think about us. Yeah. And one of the things that really helped me out because I will fully admit, I, I used to be just ravaged by that. I was always concerned with fitting in and everybody thinking I was cool and all this stuff. And then when I finally got to this point, um, it was you know when I got sober, one of the things that um, a person had told me that has also stuck with me is um, what what other people think about me is none of my business. And that's pretty much how I try and live my life every day now. And I'll tell you what, at least for me, it's helped a ton because I used to just beat myself up about my image and what people thought about me. And ever since I've stopped worrying about that, it's gotten it's gotten a lot more positive. Um, Dude. And That's the other thing too, too, the other thing too, really quick is that like nobody on this planet is actually going to know who you are, except for you, you in your head, you know, yourself, you know, your values, you know, who you are, you know, how you think the other people, even the close people to you, your, your wives, your children, your, your close friends, everything they know about you is the perception that they have formed 
based off of your actions and what they know about you. That's the closest they'll ever get to actually knowing you yeah. as you really are. And if I really think about that, it's like, why did I spend years trying so hard to impress other people that probably don't give a shit, you know? Yeah, that's exactly what I was uh, just going to say, man. That last little bit um, is if you don't know yourself truly, then it then it matters because you know because then if you if you say that somebody else's opinion uh, matters more than your own opinion of yourself, you're saying that they know you better than you know yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and it's yeah. like no, if you know who you are and what you stand for and what your true intentions are, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of you. Yeah. Um, and that is like. Once you can embrace that and, and actually practice that into, into real life, it's like you're like, I was just talking about your own emotions are, are just going to stay at a higher level Yeah, because you're not going to feel like you're being judged or you're like, you have to be somebody who you aren't to impress somebody else or that you're, you're not worthy because somebody doesn't think that you're good enough. You know, it's a, uh, it's an empowering place to live. Yeah. And you know, that feeds into one of the things, you know, even though we both do stuff on social platforms, you know, like Twitch, YouTube and whatever else, I have such a problem with social media nowadays and how things are because, you know, I hate this word, but like, like influencers on social media and stuff, they are by a lot of the public, they're put in this high pedestal of their opinion and what they're doing. And you have put, you have people that follow these influencers that will believe anything they say on their Instagram and stuff. So rather than somebody forming their own opinion about something or, you know, trusting their gut or questioning something, they'll hear somebody online say something and they'll take that opinion for face value. And effectively what they're doing is letting somebody else's opinions control theirs. And it's almost the same thing. Like yep. I see it in music a ton on doing YouTube stuff. There's, you know, um, a great example of this is when Lorna Shore started releasing their new tracks from their last EP that came out with Will, the first stuff they ever released with Will. Everybody immediately out of the gate was like, this sounds fantastic. It's fucking brutal. It's awesome. And then somebody on YouTube, like a big reactor, happened to mention this mix isn't good the vocals are buried the mix isn't great the producer didn't mix it well and then people started running with that mm. this person knows nothing about music they've never yeah. worked in the music industry they've never worked on an album but because they said they're in a place of influence and they said they think this mix is bad it fucking took off and a bunch of thousands of other people i saw online were like yeah, it's a cool song, but it's not a good mix. I was like, what makes it not a good mix? And yeah, they're like, yeah, whoa, yeah. I don't know. You know, exactly. You heard somebody else say it and you just ran with it. Yeah, it's a dangerous thing on the internet these days is uh, mistaking somebody's opinion for fact or, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's a, a fundamental thing about us humans too is like you got to question where your beliefs come from. It's like, why do you believe that? <laughs> Did mm -hmm. you actually form it yourself? Or yeah. you, yeah. You, you just read it somewhere and you, you took it as face value? Like, anything that we're saying on this, on this podcast, too, like, don't take it as fact. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, everything that we talk about, everything that I talk about on my YouTube videos is, at the end of the day, just my personal opinion formed off of my previous experiences in life and with music and stuff like that. And that's what we're doing here. We're just sharing yeah. our experiences and our opinions that we formed off of them. Like, mm -hmm. and that is, that's a great point. A lot of people need to differentiate the, the difference between factual evidence and just somebody's opinion. But where we're at right now with not just mainstream media, social media, stuff like that, that's it. That is a big problem. There's a lot of opinionated based stuff that's going around that people take at face value that is not factual at all. Very true, man. Very true. Yeah. So, man, we got we got some deep stuff here for a while. 
We did. We did. <laughs> oh, man, I like myself is, there. No, this is this is why I I loved that I've I've started trying to do this longer form podcast with people. I mean, dude, a couple days ago, I filmed an episode with Vicky from The Agonist. Right. And I told you we went three and a half hours, dude. And we talked about it's the same thing we're doing here. We just trailed off and started talking about tons and tons of different things. And this is what I love is getting to get the the ex experience and perception from somebody else about a lot of different things. Cause mm -hmm. if we, if we all start getting around people that are just agreeing about everything we say all the time and stuff too, that's going to start getting dangerous. Yeah. I like these longer forms cause you kind of get beyond the, you know, the small talk mm -hmm. uh, questions where it's like you start hanging out long enough and, and these sort of uh, topics and discussions are going to kind of expose themselves and be revealed. Yeah. Just and, naturally. And I've told uh, PR people at labels um, all the time, like whenever they ask me to do an interview with an artist, they're like, yeah, we can get you 20 minutes with them. I straight up say no. I don't care. I don't even care if somebody were like, hey, we'll get you like, I don't know, Till from Rammstein, but you got 20 minutes with them. As a content creator, I'm like, oh, that'll get mad views. Like, yeah. but in terms of substance, dude, 20 minutes is not enough with somebody because there is a certain um, ice breaking period. Even though we know each other from doing this before and talking online and stuff like that, like there's still, I guarantee you when I go back to edit this, there's still going to be about 10, 15 minutes before we really get past that phase of like, you know, starting and then getting comfortable. Yeah. hundred percent, man. And that's, uh, it's like any relationship. Mm -hmm. As any relationship, we all have a kind of a guard up until until that gets broken and uh, we're vulnerable and we're you know just like we were just talking about we don't care about what other people think mm -hmm. and it's like we just want to we just want to be real and honest for sure and that's why you know podcasts like um, Joe Rogan for example and I don't agree with a lot of things he says or talks about or anything like that. But the one thing I will give him credit for on every episode he does with people is that, I mean, he's presenting himself. Like he doesn't give a shit about everybody else's opinions and what's going and shouldn't because he got a hundred million dollars from Spotify for his fucking podcast. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> that is fucking ridiculous. But, but yeah, I, I much more enjoy those podcasters and those interviewers that, you know, actually give honest opinions and talk about real things because I imagine for you as an artist, every time you have to, and this is nothing against mainstream music outlets, but I imagine a lot of the time it's the same questions. It's, hey, you have a new album. Tell me about it. <laughs> like yeah, It is. So I try to dive away from it myself, you know, and not just give stock answers and like uh, maybe answer a different question that wasn't even there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Because because I know a lot of the people watching these watch all the interviews. They don't want to hear the same thing being told every yeah, time, yeah. you know. And like all of uh, all of our communities, they they hang out with us so much on Twitch, and they've they've heard all these things said already. So it's like, mm -hmm. how do we continue to to bring up new topics and talk about new things that nobody has heard before? Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel like. like Am I that inter am I interesting enough to do that? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, dude, this so the, the the in my opinion, my favorite thing about this, this will be the fifth episode once it goes up of this actual podcast. And in every episode, we've trailed off and talked about different things, like with different people. And it's like that's what I think is cool is that everybody has like a different perspective or different perspective on stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I had two members of Sabaton, I got wildly different perspectives and answers on a lot of the things we talked about. And that's, what's really cool for sure. Like, I mean, we like, barely even talked about music or at least the archers at all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and this, which is, which is fine. Yeah. And I'm sure it was the same with the Sabaton guys. Like I'm sure you went, you dived far off the path. Yeah. We, we definitely spent some time talking about stuff. Cause there was like the new Sabaton music video. I had to talk about this because they recorded basically almost underwater. Like they were standing in water that was up to here on them, but they were playing all their instruments. So I was oh, like, or instruments. That's what I was like. I got to know. Like, I have to know about this. 
were those replicas that like Ibanez and ESP sent to you guys, or were those the real instruments? And Joachim was like, no, those were, those were real instruments that we've used at shows live that were just near the end of their life. And the guys were getting new guitars and they're like, fuck it, let's just use them. And I was like, damn, <laughs> damn. Good giveaways. Yeah, right. You guys get it, should get on Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they need to. No. <laughs> but, Fair dude, enough. I wanted to ask you an actual, an actual question. Um, so one of the things that Vicky and I were talking about, well, again, was Twitch. And she was telling me about what Twitch has allowed her to do as a, as a, mu as a musician and stuff like that. How has Twitch helped you overall um, – just just being a musician because you get to play on stream you get to meet new people new fans while also making a little bit of an income from it and i imagine that's got to help especially from the musician standpoint oh dude it's been a absolute game changer like yeah, yeah. in in every facet of my life uh before twitch um i was still working a fucking a normal 9 to 5 job and uh, after the release of Abyss, I was like, okay, I can uh, I can go down to like working two days a week, and I've got like enough money that I can I can start doing Twitch, and then hopefully like I can build that up and and maybe kind of transition to doing this full time. And that is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, Twitch Twitch blew up. Uh, I was able to fully quit my job and. Uh, it has allowed me to become a full-time musician, yeah. right? So it's been a, an absolute game changer. Because um, the, the income from the band was like, all, like if I was a single man without a you know a, a five-person family, um, sure I could probably make it work, but it was never quite enough, right? Um, mm -hmm. But. Uh, but now mixed with everything else, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's an absolute game changer. And, um, it's been, it's, it's just been nothing but a win-win because mm -hmm. I've never felt a more closer connection with our fan base than now The you know, it's like, I actually know all these, all these members of our, you know, of our family, of the UTA family, you know, it's like, it's a community and, I don't just know them as as like okay we sold like you know our our pre-sale for the albums did like x amount of, they're not just numbers anymore you know it's like these people are like genuine friends mm -hmm. that we 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 all talk outside of Twitch and we become you know very close friends and it's like this uh a very personal experience and it makes me a better musician uh a better person because I'm, I'm having to, one, um, be online, be present, uh, five, six days a week, however, however many times I want to do it. And, uh, dude, it's, yeah, Twitch has absolutely changed my life. Yeah. That's better. awesome, man. Because I feel like people do have the misconception that anybody in a band is probably making enough money just because they're in a signed band. But... As we've talked with a lot of other musicians, that's not the case. I mean, Vicky, mm. for example, said damn near the same thing as you because she's like, yeah, the income from the band is is there, but it's like we're the size band where we also have to work other jobs. Mm -hmm. She's like, Twitch has allowed me to focus more time on my actual craft of music and connect with fans and stuff. And I, I, I think it's really cool, man, especially you see so many musicians on Twitch now. I mean, so many and, and not even yeah. just mid-level bands. I mean, you're seeing everything yeah. from independent musicians to mid-level bands to big bands. Like there's a yeah. lot of musicians on Twitch. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's completely changed from what I've seen over the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know there, there wasn't even a music section uh, years ago, you know, and uh, I know the first few people who started to play music, they got banned yeah. because it was a, a video game place. But now it's like Twitch has, has finally embraced it and realized how big of a movement this is becoming. Yeah. And, uh, dude, like, you know, guys like you as well, beyond just musicians it's like uh 
You know, I know Banger TV is going to be starting up. There's there's festivals that have channels. Um, lots of musicians are streaming the live shows. It's uh, dude, it's it's the thing that I like most about it is that it's a non toxic place to hang out on the internet. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, you it, haven't spent enough time on Twitch then. Well, <laughs> in, in your community, it's reflective of the streamer, yes. right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, if yeah, there's yeah. toxicity, you can just ban somebody and then that person is no longer around, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so you can curate who is in the community yeah. and, yeah. you know, you can create, you know, not just my community, but there's so many awesome communities on Twitch that just are, it, it's so wonderful and refreshing to see, you know, I'm, I'm part of some other uh, streamers who just stream games that I really like, you know, and it's like, um, if I have any free time and they're streaming, I just enjoy being part of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it's kind of cool because I never really realized this until recently. Uh, when I first started doing online content creation, it was almost the same thing. It was like pandemic happened. We couldn't tour. And I was like, well, I'm going to try something. And Twitch was actually what I tried before YouTube. And I realized it's very hard to get people to follow you on Twitch. Like I had like two viewers every time I streamed. And then I was like, well, maybe I'll try YouTube content first. But what I was going to lead into with what you said is that my community that's built up around my, my channels and on our discord and stuff like that are just, it's so positive and it's such a good community. And I was surprised because I know how people can get on the internet. And I always am just baffled that like our community on discord and our Twitch chat is so positive. We never have issues. We never have some asshole that comes in and I have to ban them or anything like that. Well, it's happened once or twice, but not regularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And somebody said recently, they're like, you know, communities like this online build around the person that's making the content. If you were an asshole, you'd have assholes in here. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I'm, true, glad, I'm glad you guys think I'm not an asshole. That's fucking yeah, cool. Twitch cool. chat is a reflection of the streamer for sure. Yeah. And uh, are you, have you had any growing pains in, uh, in your discord or anything like that? Mm, I mean, yeah, there's probably always been something. Um, we've had moments where I will say, I think, I think one of the biggest mistakes I made, and this is the first time I've talked about this outside of my discord channel with like somebody else. If I'm being honest, I think a big mistake that I made was when I started doing content I had partnered with another content creator to form a Discord server. So this mm. Discord server was the community for myself and another person. Right. And it started out pretty good, but I always had the thought in the back of my head, I was like, what if something happens? Like, what if, what if something happens and we don't agree or they do something or I do something? It's like, it would be a weird thing to kind of split off. And super long story short, it kind of happened. It got yeah. to, it got to a point where, um, there was a lot of weird, weird vibes and awkwardness and stuff like that. And I really realized like, this needs to be a discord server needs to be one person's community. It's very hard to get two different names in there to do that. And I have nothing against this person at all, but they, they are not a, no longer a part of our discord. And I right. haven't really talked to him since. Mm -hmm. Um, but other than that, that's just discord specific in terms of YouTube and, and Twitter and stuff or Twitch. Yeah, man. I mean, growing pains for me on Twitch were a lot of figuring out what I need. Um, cause I don't know a lot of, I, I, dude, I never knew anything about video editing or, or anything like that before I started any of this. Um, YouTube's biggest growing pain for me was how to deal with labels and publishers actually, because right. as you're aware, anytime somebody uses your music on YouTube, if the YouTube algorithm catches it, you're getting a copyright claim, a block, a strike, something, something's going to happen. And one of the things for me was um, 
I, it hit me one day. I was like, why don't I get a hold of all these labels whose bands I like and introduce myself and see if there's a way that we can just cooperate mm -hmm. rather than me just using their music like anybody else. And once I started getting responses from the labels and working in cooperation with them, like for the record, like the labels don't pay me. They've never paid me a dime. But what they will do is if they ask me to do a reaction to a new release, they'll, they'll drop the copyright claim on it. Mm -hmm. Once that became a thing, content creation has, belt, has felt so much more free in terms of I'm never going to worry if I'm going to get a block or a strike on any of my videos or stuff like that. But that is one of the reasons why I only do bans from specific labels on my channel is because, I mean, dude... There, there are a couple publishers that I, I know off the top of my head. If I do any of their videos, it's getting blocked or getting striked. No, yeah. no question. And what's the point of putting in all that work? Exactly. Or nothing. <laughs> the exactly. Video not even... And it's like, I don't even care if it gets demonetized. That's one thing. But if my normal edit for a video takes about four hours, because you've yeah. seen my videos, I put in the facts, I do research on what's going on. It, it's a long edit. And it does, it feels infuriating if I edit a video and put so much time and effort into it and I'm super proud of it. And then I upload it on YouTube and it's like blocked worldwide. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, well there it goes, half of a day of my life. Yeah, and, and it's happened with a lot of big bands that I actually like talk to now. I mean, dude, early on on my page when I would try and do like Sabaton or something, all my videos would get fucking blocked. Yeah. But ever since I've actually like introduced myself to their, to their label and stuff like that. So growing pains in terms of stuff like that for me were more that it was more learning, like treading the waters and learning how I'm going to find my groove and turn this into like an actual, I wouldn't say business model, but figure out the right way to do things. Yeah. Like a well-oiled machine. Yes. You kept, yeah. You yeah, got yeah, a yeah, formula yeah. that works. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but what I've seen, especially my community and from yours, because I spend a lot of time in your Twitch, like the generosity of people sometimes is still astounding to me because we don't we don't necessarily charge for our content. No, I don't paywall any paywall anything. But people are still willing to donate or sub or stuff like that. And it's just it's it's a very humbling and rewarding feeling at the same time. Dude, it's it's it is seriously unbelievable mm -hmm. the the support of uh, of the metal community. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, absolutely. It, is, it blows my mind. You know, I I never once thought that uh, I would start Twitch and and be able to do it essentially full time. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, it's you, you know, know for you about, like. You know, I started to do it. I started to stream like a couple guitar performances live on Instagram. And then people were like, oh, man, like you can have a better setup if you do it on Twitch. Like you can have like proper inputs and cameras and stuff like that. I was like, oh, OK, like it was more about like putting on like a good performance. And then and then the support came. It was like, holy cow, like, OK, maybe I'll keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and for me, as somebody who watches your streams, like as a fan and as a viewer, it's entertaining as hell, man. I mean, think about the technology where we're at now, or think about, let's say even just 15 years ago, nobody could get the behind the scenes look at their favorite bands. Like they're able to now people yeah. get a peek into your life and see you at home off the stage. And that's what people love, man. They love seeing that again, that goes back to the whole, seeing the human element of your favorite bands rather than this larger than life persona. That's only a person on stage. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, uh, the whole perspective or like stereotype of, of like rock stars have, has completely changed over the past 20 years where it's, it's no longer this like fictitious, uh, figure that shows up like once in a blue moon on a stage. And it's like this, like, yeah, larger than life. It's like, um, like Trenton Reznor had, um, uh, his theory, the, ha the thousand true fans theory, you know, it's like, instead of having a million fans, it's about having like a, a very small, close, tight group of fans where as like you open them up into your life and it becomes something more personal.
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of like the, the, the day and age we live in where I, I think it's, it's more uh, powerful to, to do that than to just like stay behind closed doors and like pop out every now and then. Um, Cause people like to see, you know, I think people can relate to you a little bit more if you show them that you're not always perfect. And that's, um, I think that's a hard thing for some musicians to, uh, to come to grips to going to Twitch is because, you know, it's not always this refined performance that you're, that you're playing for everybody. You know, you're, you're spending a lot of time on there sometimes learning something and people see, oh, okay, this, this guy does make mistakes. Like, he, yeah. you know, people always like, you know, that's the downfall of social media. It's like everyone always sees the final product, you know, the edited image, the edited music video, uh, the set on stage that you've rehearsed for months or years, some of these songs, and, like, mm-hmm. you come and you play it perfect. It's like, it, that's not reality, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. And that's why I like watching people like you and uh, Dean from Archspire, Adam from Lorna Shore. Like, Dean is one of those that I always like to use an example because that's what he does in his streams. Like, you'll see him Mm -hmm. mess up all the time and he'll just laugh at himself about it. And I actually think that that's a very important thing, especially for young aspiring musicians to see. Because if they just see polished, finished products they might get the sense that they never, they can never accomplish that. They, they can never get to that level. But if they mm-hmm. see their heroes and their idols that they like look up to in the musical world make the same mistakes that they do, they're like, oh, it's okay if I make a mistake. Like, yeah. like you know. Yeah. You know. And the thing is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor for real life as well as guitar playing. But if you're not making mistakes, then you're not progressing. Mm-hmm. So you're not trying something new that you haven't done yet before, mm-hmm. you know? So, and in order, you know, it's like, yeah, you want, you want to be playing things properly, but if you're not trying to play something out of your comfort zone to, to grow and become a better player, which involves doing something you haven't done before, playing something you haven't done before, which inevitably you're going to make a mistake in the process of getting it down or, you know, in life, if you're, if you're trying to uh, achieve something you haven't achieved before, if you're trying, um, you know, a new job, a new skill, a new passion, if you're trying to pursue something that you haven't done before, it requires you to do something you haven't done before, which, (laughs) you know, you're bound to make some mistakes to figure it out. And you got, you know, I think people need to realize that that is okay. And that's part of the process. You have to make those mistakes. Mm Mm-hmm. And it is. And that's, you know, I've talked about this with a couple other musicians on the podcast too, but it's like one of the things on YouTube right now is like you see so many guitar playthroughs and drum playthroughs and vocal one takes and stuff that are are very much edited to perfection. And that's that's why I think the Twitch element where you have to play live and on the spot has helped uh, music a ton because all these videos on YouTube where, you know, you keep getting different camera angles and stuff like that and stuff like usually on YouTube, what you're getting is somebody recording a perfect recording and then just playing over it. Like that's sadly, that's really what YouTube is now to those people's credit. YouTube is about the performance and having a good video and stuff like that. So I'm not really hating on them for it, but a lot of people watch those videos thinking that like, oh damn, this person is that good that they can rip this ridiculous song and solo in one take flawlessly. And that's 99.9% of the time that is not the case. Yeah, yeah. And even those fakes are usually edited slightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I when I, I only have a few bass playthroughs on my channel and I can honestly say that the ones that I did were one take because there was something in my head where I was like, I have to do this in one take, otherwise I'm not being honest. And I do have a couple different camera angles that I switch back and forth to, but those those base covers on my channel are one take. But I realized that nobody that watched that gave a shit that it was one take. No, they just no, want to hear no. the, the polished finished product. Yeah. So... Well, dude, 
I know you're on a time schedule because you've got family stuff to do. And we got a couple minutes, but before um, before I get you out of here, I just wanted to check. I know that you guys, you know, finished up some touring and stuff. Do you guys have anything um, coming up anytime soon? I didn't see anything announced, but is there anything you're looking forward to? Uh, right now, we're are we are just working on the new album. Oh. So that is the plan for the rest of the year. We, uh, we're we starting to book some things show-wise for 2023. We're later in the fall. Uh, but like I said, we kind of go into these seasons of, um, of focus. And right now it is, it is on the new album. Uh, Nick just flew out here this week to, to do some songwriting with us as well. Uh, we just got... Uh, well, I don't know if I'm allowed to really share that, but we do. <laughs> uh, let's just say we got some info from Brett that helps direct some of the music. Cool. 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 <laughs> so, so things are starting to kind of slowly come into play. We're kind of coming off of a, a bit of a, um, uh, a time away from each other. And uh, things are going to be ramping up here pretty quick. Cool. Um, this month has been pretty busy for me for like other performances. I've got Hyperspace Metal Fest coming up next weekend, which Andy and I's old band Archon Legion is doing a reunion for. Oh, that's awesome. And then, awesome. And then I'm also uh, playing guitar for Dire Peril, a U.S. power metal band. So, uh, and then... I did Lord of the Trident last weekend. So once this month is done, then we I, I personally can kind of focus more just on the new album uh, for the rest of the year. And then, um, yeah, there's already some things being booked for 2023 that are really uh, big and exciting that will have to be announced later on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, for sure. I know there's going to be a uh, an Apex yearbook coming out so we did an earbook for abyss uh which is like um you know a big hardcover book with like the the chapters of each track actually like written out the chapters with uh cool artwork and studio footage and things like that so we're putting together an earbook for apex because we didn't release one for that when we released apex in 2017 so a few things like that are going to kind of be coming out to keep people uh interested over the time that we spend writing but yeah man new album is is the main focus we we want to get that finished written recorded and then we're going to be doing the the touring cycle again hopefully with the the whole world opened up yeah because we yeah. had uh we had a lot of cool things in 2020 that were supposed to go through like japan and australia and uh, south america that never ended up happening and we never were able to rebook them so it's gonna kind of get pushed to the next touring cycle so yeah right now we're just kind of enjoying our our kind of hibernation at home until things get crazy again so we're looking at 2023 being a pretty damn big year for unleash the archers then that's what it's looking like yeah new yes. album and, and touring cycle yeah that's awesome man well while you guys are working on that and figuring stuff out in the meantime um what's the best way for fans to help you guys out just supporting the band in the meantime yeah i mean unleash the archers.com you can find everything there our uh european merch store our north american merch store uh you can join our discord there which you'll get notified anytime any of us go live on twitch uh we all pretty much stream on twitch pretty consistently we've got a band page that we do uh D, &D sessions uh, once a month, we've got one coming up uh, this Sunday uh, in two days. Nice. Uh, the tonight, on the tenth, April tenth. I'm sure this will come out before then, but uh, no, this will, yeah, I was gonna say this will probably come out after then, but still. <laughs> yeah, but we we're, we've been doing it once a month uh, on a Sunday, uh, and that's something that uh, we carried through after the release of Abyss. When we did uh, Abyss, we had a contest like five people who uh, bought the the pre-orders got to do a D, D session with us yeah, yeah and then we had so much fun doing that we're like oh we should just make this a regular thing with just the band nice so nice. yeah we do that um yeah man just i think uh the biggest thing that helps 
uh, support us is just spreading the word, you know. I think we've gotten where we are right now because of word of mouth and people just sharing uh, the music. If you if you resonate with it, if you if you enjoy it, then share it with your best friend, your uncle, your aunt, uh, your neighbor, everyone, you know. For Wear sure. the shirts, wear them out. When people ask, who, who is that? You tell them. Whatever you, whatever you think of us. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. Well, speaking of spreading the word for anybody that's watching this on YouTube, I'll have links in the video description with, you know, all, all your guys' social medias and your Twitch and stuff like that. And for anybody that's listening to this in podcast form, uh, unleashthearchers.com, all the information that you need on the band, their merch stores, their touring schedule, their social medias, all of that's on there. Grant, I cannot thank you enough for being here and being open and honest and having some good conversations. This was fun, man. Dude, thank you, man. Anytime. You you ask me if I want to come on anytime, I will make uh, a chunk of time available for you. Well, as long as Zoom... Uh, we might have to do it again if Zoom decides to fuck up all of this when I go to edit it, but <laughs> I think I think we'll be good though, man. But seriously, man, thank you very, very much for your time. It's always great to talk to you and have a great rest of the day doing whatever you're doing and I'll talk to you very soon. Much love, dude. Thank you so much. See you, man. So to anybody that's still listening or watching the video on YouTube, Thank you for making it this far. Obviously, you heard we had some audio issues, some technical issues, and I apologize if that was difficult to listen to. But like I said, going into this, I felt as though that this was a conversation that needed to be heard regardless of how it sounded. And I hope that everybody really enjoyed this, man. You know, I've really got to thank Grant for being able to be open and vulnerable and honest in some of those moments and some of the things we talked about, man. It's not easy. As somebody that also has had addiction issues in their life, it's not easy to talk about these things and be open with other people about it at times. You're afraid what people are going to think. You're embarrassed. You're scared. And the fact that we were able to talk about this openly was just amazing to me. That's the only way I can really describe it. So I hope a lot of you guys enjoyed that, man. And you know, for those of you that already know Grant, you probably follow him on social media, but for anybody that's listening to this and wants to know more about Grant or see him more, you can check out his band, Unleash the Archers, which is just one of his bands. He has many. He also streams regularly on Twitch. His streams are highly entertaining. He plays a lot of guitar every now and then he's working out and pumping iron but I'll throw links to all of his stuff in the description of the video if you're watching on YouTube where you can go check out all of his stuff. And again, once more, thank you to Grant. That was fantastic. Maybe we'll have him back again to attempt this without any of the audio issues, but it was just great all around. So that's enough from me. Before we wrap up, thank you to all of you that are watching, that are listening. You can follow me on tons of different social media platforms. My handle on everything is at tank the tech. You can follow me on YouTube. I stream on Twitch and I've got a bunch of other stuff. And again, if you're watching on YouTube, I'll throw links in the description of this video. For the next episode, episode six of the Back Lounge podcast, We've got Alex from the UK-based metal act Malevolence, man. And this is an interesting one because we don't know each other. We had never met each other before we did the podcast, but we got along right away, man. And we had some fun conversations. So be on the lookout for episode six. Thank you to everybody for watching and listening. And I will see you again very soon for another episode of the Back Lounge Podcast.